together and shout to the north. faith rise up and sing of the great and glorious king you are strong when you feel weak in your brokenness complete shout to the north and the south sing to the east and the west jesus is savior to all lord of heaven and earth rise up women of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I've got a, I got a verse to start us off with here, and I'm actually going to end with a couple verses from the same chapter. It's from Psalm chapter 62. Here's how it begins, and then I'll share a little bit more of it at the benediction. But Psalm 62 begins with this. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my rock. That's going to come in very handy in a little bit. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He's my fortress. I will never be shaken. The next song that we want to lead you in is a song that, uh, it's a hymn that's been reinvented. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's called Cornerstone. We're going to get to talking about that in a bit. Would you just lift your voices and let's sing it together. My hope is built
and at the end of all things. When he shall come with trumpet sound. that he is going to be strong through any storm that we could go through. We've been through a few over the last year or two, year and a half or two years. You've probably noticed that, probably. But uh, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. Amen. One more shout song. Shout to the Lord. All the earth let us sing power and majesty. Praise to who? To the King. Let's sing it together. Starts off with focusing our attention right on Jesus Christ. Here it is. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, not my Lord. Here we go.
God, nothing does compare to the promise that we have in you. And so, Father, would you just solidify that concept in our hearts and minds this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Roger's going to come up and share the scripture lesson with us this morning, and then we'll move into one more song together. Today's scripture reading is taken from 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 12. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message. Which, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, Roger. One more song before we lead ourselves into a time of prayer together. It's just some things to, uh, to keep in mind. We want to remember the Woodward family. Uh, they laid to rest Scott yesterday and uh, had a memorial service. Uh, Joyce Garrison uh, lost her brother Thomas, and we've been praying for her and her family as well. Pastor Harry's up at Schuyler. Uh, was, is really hoping to be out for, uh, for a, a wedding that's coming up. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And, uh, but he had a bit of a setback over the weekend, and... Um, uh, I was talking to Bess yesterday, and uh, so he's feeling pretty discouraged. So we want to lift up Pastor Harry and uh, uh, that family as well as he's on recuperating, but it's just a, a real slow process. Uh, Pat Brown from our service is, is home from the hospital and recuperating. And uh, so it's just a number of things. Linda Janowski, I mean, there's a lot of things. As the pastor, you get a lot of stuff going across, and you know others as well. Uh, the altar's open if you'd like to come. Here's a wonderful song for us to kind of conclude our time of music together. It's just simply in Christ alone. And uh, allow these words just to minister to you as we go into a time of prayer together. Would you stand with us? And let's sing together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Stand. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave. He
best part of it as Christians living in the world today. Are you ready? Here it is. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my day. Father God, that's what we want to do is to stand in the power of Christ alone. Not in anything that we can do, anything that we've built upon this world, any health that we have or wealth that we may acquire. That really it's all about Jesus being the cornerstone of who we are, the cornerstone of our lives, the cornerstone of this church, the cornerstone of, uh, 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 of, of our existence here on this planet. Mankind is nothing without you. And so, Father, we're just so grateful that we're a part of a church that does that, that focuses on, on Jesus Christ, that shouts to Jesus, the comforter and the keeper of our souls, the rock of our salvation. And, Father, it's in times of mourning, it's in times of sadness that we turn to you. And we ask that you would be that comforter, as it says. And every time I hear that, that word in that particular song, uh, I, I think of a comforter. I think of a, a warm, downy blanket that gets wrapped around me, makes me feel safe and secure. And God wants to do that for us. He, you want to wrap us in that, especially when we're hurting, especially during the loss of a loved one or struggling through a disease or some sort of sickness or ailment. And so, Father, for those that are doing that right now, we think of the Woodward family or the Garrison family, Father, we just ask that you would be the comforter and you would wrap your loving arms around them and just hold them tight. And I know they're not the only ones that are dealing with loss at this time. Some of us dealt with loss a year ago, and it's just coming back again one more time as it uh, always seems to creep in at times and, and say, do you remember this person? And, uh, and, and the person that you don't have anymore, and you just... You, you revisit that loss again. And so, Father, our hearts go out to those that may be hurting today, and we ask that you would just be with them. Father, we're going to start a new series on this whole idea of I love my church. I don't know if people notice that with the T-shirt or not. It's pretty blatant. <laughs> but, uh, Father, I want to talk about, well, not just Bentley Creek, but, yeah, I guess just about Bentley Creek, about this church. I can't speak for other churches. I've got to speak for this one. And why I love this church so much. And, uh, Father, talk about it from your word. And so I pray that you would just be with us here today as we kind of step into this new series, step into this time together. And you'd help us all to get a, a really good understanding of what the church is for and uh, what we stand for and why it's such a great place to be. I ask all this in the precious name of the one who's responsible for it. We'll talk about that in a minute. And that be your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Uh, oh. <coughs> Let me clear my throat there. there now, now I'll put this microphone on there. There we go. All right, so I didn't know if you noticed that we were in a new series today. Had no idea. We even colored the bulletin. And I will tell you that for the next four weeks, over the month of February, we are doing this series called I Love My Church. And yes, it's patterned after the I Love New York. Because some of you are from New York, in New York and you really don't love New York all that much right now. I know, I know. There's some things going on up there in communist New York that you're thinking, oh my goodness. Did I say that? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be political. But you know, you go up to New York and you think about what's going on up there and you think, oh, I don't want to wear a shirt like that. It says I Love New York. Well, that's the whole point. People will look at it and go, oh my goodness, New York, you love New York. And the, oh, it says my. Oh, I love my church. What church is yours? It's this church right here is what this church is. 
So yes, we have purchased swag, and yes, we're going to be selling it. For right now, Pastor Jake and I are the only two that are wearing it, mainly because Amy won't wear a T-shirt in February. It's not going to happen. She had a sweater on today, all wrapped up nice and snugly warm. I'm like, you should wear a T-shirt, too. And she's like, yeah, no, she won't do it. All right, so uh, she's not listening to her pastor at all. I don't know what's going on there, but... uh, So we wanted to do this whole series on I Love My Church, and I want to share some reasons with you why. And uh, I'm doing it for the next three weeks. And then on the fourth week of February, Pastor Jake and I are switching spots. I'm going down to Children's Church, so he's going to be preaching. And I asked him, I said, are you going to be continuing this series and doing one more? I told him what I was going to be sharing over the next three weeks. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to go in this direction. And I said, oh, okay. And then he leaned out into the thing and goes, Amy, that means we're going to need four weeks of bulletins with the red heart because we're printing them in color because it just kind of looks sad if you got I love my church on the front of your bulletin and it's in gray scale. And he's like, yeah, we're going to need four weeks. And I looked at him and went, dude, you're an assistant pastor. You get gray scale. I mean, for crying out loud. I mean, I'm the lead pastor. My sermons and my bulletin should be in red. His should be in gray scale. Can I get an amen? Yeah, I didn't think so. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, he kind of gave me the same look like, "Uh, yeah, we're going to do them in full color. And Amy voted me down as well. And so that's where we're going over the next four weeks. We're going to be sharing uh, reasons why we love our church, love this church. And yeah, I, I could talk about the church as a, as a whole, you know, the evangelical church of Christ, but well, I, I, I don't know all those churches. I know this one. I've been around here for a while, so I know this church. And as we were kind of getting ready for this series to talk about it, Joy Coddington, I'm going to pick on her just a little bit, Joy Coddington brought this song to me, and she says, we really need this song as part of the, the worship time. We need to, we need to include this song sometime during the series. And I got to be admit to you, and don't tell her I said this, but you know, there are, there are some songs that she brings that you like, you know, I don't know. She, she's got different tastes than I do. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not learning that song. I'm not going to sing that song. And I've done that to her on a number of different occasions. And so when she says she's got a song, sometimes me is the, you know, oh, really? Oh, God, this is a really cool song. So I, my humblest apologies. We were listening to it on Wednesday together. And I'm like, oh, man, I have got to learn this church, the, the, this song. It's entitled Church. Take Me Back. And if you are on Spotify, you're on Apple Music, you want to get a hold of it, it's by Cochran and Company. So I would dare say you need to start listening to it because we're going to sing it at least as a special and you folks will get the lyrics and you can sing along if you want to. For today, let me just share the lyrics of it. It is a, it's a great song, all right? It says this. There was a time that I swore I would never go back. I was blind to the truth, didn't know what I had. I was running. I was searching, but every place I turned for healing left me more broken than the last. Then he goes into the chorus. Take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a verse where they've seen me at my worst, to the love I had at first. Oh, I want to go to church. The second verse goes like this. Tried to walk on my own, but I wound up lost. Now I'm making my way to the foot of the cross. It's not a trophy for the winners. It's a shelter for the sinners. And it's right where I belong. Take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher in a verse where they've seen me at my worst, to the love I had at first. Oh, I want to go to church. And I, I, I love the bridge. The bridge goes like this. Oh, it's more than an obligation. It's, a, it's our foundation, the family of God. I know it's hard, but we need each other. We're, we're sisters and brothers. And then it goes right back into take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a verse where they've seen me at my worst, to the love I had at first. Oh, I want to go to church. And I hope if there's anything you get out of this series is this idea that I love my church. And there's reasons why I love my church. And you folks have a lot to do with it. So I, I, I hopefully you don't get big heads as we talk together. But I've got some things to talk about about you people and the reason why I love this church. And some of it has to do with you. Some of it has to do with the community. We'll get into that as we go along. But let me get... <clears throat> I haven't even started my message yet. Are you ready? I'm about ready to start into my notes. That was just, that was just a precursor. Yeah, don't worry, we'll get done on time, or maybe, I don't know. Uh, here we go. Ready? 
I've been a pastor for over 30 years, okay? And over my tenure as being a pastor, I've been to four different churches, including this one. Three former churches, all right? The first two were on the Western Pennsylvania District, which a few years ago, we combined with them, and now we're the Penn York District. So now those churches that I used to pastor at are actually a part of our district nowadays. My very first church was in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, all the way on the other side of the state, right across from Youngstown, Ohio. And I served there as an assistant pastor for like five years as youth and music. Then I moved to the Armbrust Wesleyan Church, which is down by Pittsburgh and a little east of Pittsburgh, and I served in the same capacity, youth and music, for about seven years. Then my third church was way out in Rice Lake, Wisconsin, still trying to figure out how I got way out there. But I was out there for a couple years, and I served in the same role that Pastor Jake serves in, although back in the day it was called Family Ministries Pastor. Now it's called Next Gen, Next Generation. It's a cooler name than I had when I was going through I came to Bentley Creek to serve as pastor in 2003. This July will mark the beginning of my 20th year here at this church. And all God's people went, oh, it's all right. I don't have a problem with that. Now, I must tell you, I've had good experiences at all three of my former churches, okay? That's not true for many of my colleagues, many of my pastors. I talk to a lot of my pastor friends, both on this district and around uh, the denomination and other denominations as well. And I have colleagues that have told me absolute horror stories about the churches where they've served. I mean, abs- make you cry. Like, you, what? You're dealing with what? Church dissension, church factions, horrible leadership, inadequate funds, moral failures, you name it. And they're dealing with it. I'm thinking, wow, I never, I never had that. I have personally been blessed with healthy, positive experiences at each of my former churches. Now, when I was candidating 20 years ago, uh, back in 2003, for this position, Pastor Harry Berger, all right, now that would be Beth's dad, for those of you who may not know who that person is. He's the guy that retired from this church, and then I took over after him. He was at the meet and greet that weekend, and he made a comment at one of those meet and greets that I thought was extremely presumptuous, okay? He stated publicly in front of everybody that was there this, and I quote, by far, this is the best church he had ever pastored. And I thought to myself, hey, man, you, you don't need to brown nose as much, man. You're leaving. You know, I thought, you gotta, you're shoveling an awful thick here at this meet and greet. When I'm the one who wants the job, you're the one leaving. And yet he was just talking it up. I thought it was a nice thing to say, to, but to be honest, I wasn't sure how much of it was flattery and how much of it was actual fact. Over the years, I've found it personally to be, well, a fact. I love Bentley Creek Wesleyan. I do. And it has truly been my favorite church to pastor in all this time. It it really has. And that's not saying anything bad about the last three churches. I had great experiences there. This is an awesome church. I love my church, and I would like to take the next three weeks and tell you why I love this church. In the uncertainty of 2022, not to mention the tumultuous times that we know are coming upon us in the last days, being connected to a body of believers will be absolutely crucial to one's spiritual health and vitality. I truly believe that with all my heart, that being a part of church, being a part of a body of Christ, a family of God, is going to be vital for people. Vital. Over the next three weeks, I'd like to share several reasons why I love my church. All right? This week, I want to look at the scripture lesson that Roger shared with us, and I would like to share with you three rock-solid, that's what I want to call them, rock-solid reasons why I love this church. Here we go. Here's the first one. Number one, I love my church because we believe in the cornerstone of Christ. That, that deserves an amen. I'm just wondering. Okay, you got it. In this passage, Peter quotes both Isaiah and King David as they prophesied concerning the coming Messiah, that being Jesus Christ. First, Peter quotes the prophet Isaiah. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious, and here's the word, cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. That's both 1 Peter 2.6 and Isaiah 28.16. Same verse. Then Peter quotes King David. He says this, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. That's 1 Peter 2.7 and Psalm 118.22. In fact, here's the whole phrase written by David in Psalm 118. It goes like this, The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this. And it is marvelous in our eyes. That's a cool phrase. 
Peter then quotes Isaiah again, a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Again, that's both 1 Peter 2, 8, as well as Isaiah 8, 14. I love my church because we believe in the cornerstone of Christ. There are a lot of churches out there who claim to be Christian churches and yet don't operate with Christ as their cornerstone. I mean, I have seen churches over the years, and I've seen churches going through this pandemic and such that have reopened and have not reopened it with Christ as their cornerstone. Man, they're built on all kinds of things, on the pastor, on the building, on the worship and, and what's happening up here musically, on the discussion of current affairs, on politics, all kinds of stuff. But not this church. Not Bentley Creek Wesleyan. I would say, as the old song goes, and we've reinvented it to sing it right here in church this morning, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but we wholly lean on Jesus' name. Here at Bentley Creek Wesleyan, we are Christians, followers and disciples of Jesus Christ long before we are evangelicals or Protestants or even Wesleyans for that matter. We're big on the Wesleyan, but I'll tell you what, we're Christians first. We may preach and teach about other characters in the Bible. I mean, we just spent a whole month talking about Joshua or Mary or the Good Samaritan. However, we hold a foundational belief in the cornerstone of Christ at this church. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the, we just came out of Christmas, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Jesus is the son of God. He's the savior of the world. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone of our faith and the cornerstone of this church. And that's why I love this church. I I don't don't know if I could handle a church where Christ wasn't the cornerstone of it. Yeah, here's another rock-solid reason that you see Peter talking about. Number two, I'd give you this. I love my church because we believe in the building blocks of Scripture. I love this small phrase that Peter uses in verse 6 to begin quoting the writers of the Old Testament. I mean, he, he quotes Isaiah, he quotes David, he, he does all that. But here's this little phrase that he says before he does it. For in Scripture it says. You see, Peter doesn't want his readers to take his word for it, but refers them to the Holy Scriptures of God. I love that we do the same thing. Pastor Rob doesn't get up here. Pastor Jake doesn't get up here and just rattle off their opinion about stuff. We always take it back. You know, the Bible says. You know, the Bible says. You know, the Bible says. We're always saying that. We sound like uh, Billy Graham. Not as good as him, but uh, have you ever noticed? You listen to old Billy Graham talks. He's always saying, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. When he was asked about that in an interview, he says, because it's not about what I got to say. The Bible says. So he keeps telling you, this is what the Word of God says. Well, I want to be that kind of preacher. I don't want to be, hey, I've been thinking, and this is my opinion about this, and you ought to take it because I'm the pastor. No, the Bible says. I like like telling you what the Word of God says. Here's what we Wesleyans believe about the Bible. This, This comes straight from the discipline of the Wesleyan Church, our big old book of polity. It says this, we believe that the books of the Old and New Testaments constitute the Holy Scriptures. They are the inspired and infallibly written word of God, fully inerrant in their original manuscripts and superior to all human authority and have been transmitted to the present without corruption of any essential doctrine. I love that. We believe the scriptures to be the building blocks of our faith. There's a song out there by Casting Crowns called The Word is Alive. No, I'm not going to sing the song for you. I won't even quote the lyrics. But during the bridge... Some guy is just talking in the background of that song. If you've ever heard the radio version of it, there's this guy that just starts talking in the middle. And this is what he has to say. He says, the Bible was inscribed over a period of 2,000 years in times of war and in days of peace by kings, physicians, tax collectors, farmers, fishermen, singers, and shepherds. The marvel is that a library so perfectly cohesive could have been produced by such a diverse crowd over a period of time which staggers the imagination. Jesus is its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God is its end. I tell you what, when he hits the chorus after saying all that, I can't help but shout out that chorus. Shout to the Lord all the... Uh, that's just powerful. That middle section there, listen to that again. The marvel is that a library so perfectly cohesive 
could have been produced by such a diverse crowd over a period of time which staggers the imagination. For those of you who are in my Immerse life group and you've been following along, we read Messiah, the whole entire New Testament. Then we went to beginnings, Genesis through Deuteronomy. We're now about almost halfway through uh, what's called kingdoms, which is Joshua judges uh, Ruth, first and second kings, first and second chronicle. Uh, nope. First and second Samuel, first and second kings. It's called Samuel Kings kind of thing. So we're in the middle of uh, uh, first Samuel right this moment. But what we've noticed through our immersed time is that it's amazing what what Moses said here and how it got picked up by Joshua here and got picked up by David over here. And you're like, this is just amazing that it's so cohesive, written by so many authors over so much period of time. This is the word of God. The book of Hebrews describes the scriptures this way, and I know you've heard this, but I gave you two different words to fill in. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword, and this is what it does. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Here's another thing. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It penetrates and it judges. Have you ever gotten in trouble for being holier than thou? Anybody here? You know, somebody, one of your friends or relatives, I've had a relative come up to me, I just can't live by your holy than thou standards. And I'm thinking, they're not mine. I didn't come up with these standards. I, I'm a sinner in the hands of, a, of an angry God at times, for crying out loud. I'm, I'm not that great. They aren't my standards. They're God's. The Bible says to do things that way. I'm just trying desperately through the power of the Holy Spirit to live my life for Jesus. That's all I'm doing. But I've been accused of that. Oh, I just can't live by your standards. They're not mine. The Word of God has a way of penetrating right to the middle of it and saying, it doesn't matter what you've heard, what you've seen, what persons have told you. The Word of God says this is the right way. Oh, okay. And it judges. Well, I've been doing it this way because of such as it doesn't matter. The Bible judges and says, this is the way it's supposed to be done. Wow. Paul wrote this to Timothy. Again, I put it in your notes. All scripture is God breathed. That is, that is, it's written by men, but is inspired by the very breath of God. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Did you catch all those? All four of those things that scripture does for us? The word teaching means to impart knowledge. Now, we, we all know that. We all, our kids go to Sunday school or they go to children's church or out there with Jake right now or Creekside Kids on a Thursday. We're teaching them. We're helping them. We're imparting the scriptural knowledge to them. The Bible does that. The word rebuking means to express sharp or stern disapproval. Any of you parents ever rebuked your kid at all? No, they're all perfect. When, we, when Noah was a little kid, we had these little plaques that were on this, about three foot off the ground on every door frame in our house. Every door frame had one of these little plaques, and on them were scriptures about godly, uh, godly character. All right, The one he got taken to all the time was the bathroom. The bathroom door had one about sharing with others. And you would take him to the door frame, and you'd go, what's that say? Do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Are you sharing with others? No. Are you supposed to? Are you supposed? Yes. <laughs> and get back in there with your cousin and share. You know, I mean, that's what we did. We rebuked him. You're not living the way you're supposed to be living. You're not doing things the way you're supposed to. I'm going to take you to the doorpost. We're going to get that in a moment. You're going, why the world did you stick them on plaques and stick them on the door frames of your house? Oh, wait, we'll get there. But we rebuke our kids. The word of God is good for rebuking. The word of God corrects. That means to, to make something true, accurate, or to remove errors. Haven't you ever had to correct somebody? Oh, no, no. Here's one. I'll, I'll correct you right now. God helps those who help themselves. That's in the Bible. No, it's not. That's not in the Bible. That's in First Ridiculous 2.13. That's where you can find that. God does not help those who can help themselves. The Bible is all about God helping those who can't help themselves. That would be me. I can't do it on my own. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in me. I need Jesus in me. I can't do it on my own. Yet that's what the Bible is all about. God helps those who help themselves is a nice verse, but it ain't biblical. We need to correct ourselves on that. Quit using that and claiming it's scripture. It's not. Or, or how about this one, the word training? It means to make proficient. Why do you think we make our kids memorize scripture? Why do you think we keep pouring it into them? Because training makes people proficient in it, so they remember it. Noah couldn't read when he would rattle that off. You know why? Because he didn't know how to share. He was at that door a lot, a lot. He's an only child. He didn't have to share nothing. When people came over, it's like, excuse me, 
This is mine. Anybody got any only children that acted like that? Oh, you got children with siblings who act like that. Amen? Whew, been there, done that. All four of these building blocks not only apply to us as, as believing adults, but they're even more so for our children. From the very beginning, God was telling his people to make sure Scripture was taught to their children, getting it out there to them. Probably the most famous line has got to be that passage out of Deuteronomy 6, which is where we got this idea from, all right? This is what Moses told the children of Israel. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. We took that very seriously when Noah was young, and we took a lot of scriptures that had to do with godly character, and we stuck them at the three-foot mark on every single door frame. And if he was not sharing, we went there. If he was dealing with a bad attitude and not obeying his parents, he went over there. That was another one that he spent a lot of time at. I'm sorry. Noah's probably watching this on live, and he's probably sitting there going, I'm not sure I like you anymore, you know? Praise God, we do that here. That's why I love this church. Man, through Sunday school and Creekside Kids and Children's Church, Pastor Jake and the ministries that he's got going, we do that with our children. And I hopefully do that with you as well. And here's one more reason I want to share with you. I love my church because it's filled with the living stones of God's people. That's what Peter called us. Did you catch that? He called us living stones. It's in verse 5. And I put it in your notes. He said, you also, he's talking to you, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. And here's another word you really ought to catch. Through Jesus Christ. Not through anything I can do. It's not like I come to church and I'm all holier than down. I can make it happen. No, through Jesus Christ. I, I love that he put that at the end. I don't know if you've noticed this. There's not a lot going on construction-wise in the last couple of years because of supply, supply chains and all this kind of such. But before that, have you ever noticed uh, back when they were, you know, the housing boom was going on, everybody was building all these kind of homes, that they all looked the same? You could drive down through a, like a, 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 a neighborhood, a new, a new development, and it just seemed like all the houses looked almost exactly the same. Sure, different colors of, of siding, that kind of thing. And, and, and as you looked, you could go, well, I guess they don't really look the same. There's maybe four to six different layouts that are in here. But basically, it looks like somebody walked in with a cookie-cutter house thing and went, look, houses. Aren't they pretty? When the sun comes out in the summer, they'll grow up nice and strong. You know, I, it just everything looked the same. You go into some of these neighborhoods, you're like, I don't know which house is mine. I've lived here 20 years. I still don't know where I am. You know, because everything looks exactly the same. Like someone just come along and, and just kind of put the whole, put them all out there together. Well, based on the tagline that's out on our, our, out on our sign out front, we're the stone church with a warm heart. That, that's our tagline. That's to say, first of all, that we're the church that's made out of Stone. Yeah, we're, we're made out of building rocks. You know, we're, we're made out of field stones. In fact, I believe that we're the only building. I drove around a little bit yesterday just to kind of take a look. I, I think we're the only building in town, in the village, that's actually made out of stone. Uh, there are three churches in town, but the other two are made out of clapboard. They're, they're white clapboard churches. Ours is the only one made out of stone. Only ours. And because of it, well, we're unique. It's quickly recognizable and distinguishable among the churches in our village. I've, I've talked to people, and they say, hey, I'm coming down uh, the Berwick Turnpike out of Wellsburg. Yeah, which church is yours down in there? Oh, the stone one. Oh, oh, oh okay, yeah, the one across from the fire hall or whatever. Yeah, you tell them it's the stone one. It's the only stone one in town. It's, it's pretty easy to pick us out. And my hope is that the people of Bentley Creek Wesleyan are the same, right? I believe that Christians need to be recognizable and distinguishable within the culture in which they live. Don't, don't you feel that way? That we, we ought to be unique, you know, like living stones, they are unique when held in contrast to the world around them. You know, Christians should walk differently, talk differently, treat people differently, have a different worldview than the people around them. They, they deal with disappointment and sorrow, tragedy, different than others. Remember, remember that from uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? I don't want you to grieve like men who have no hope. You know, I want you to grieve, not that you don't grieve at, at a loss, but you grieve differently than those who have no hope. All this makes us unique. We are the stone church, yeah, but with a warm heart. That's the other half of the tag. Just like our physical church is recognizable in the community because of what it's made of, 
The believers who worship in this building are recognizable because of what they're made of. Or at least I hope we are, right? I hope we are. That's our goal anyways, right? To be, to be different, to be unique, to be followers of Jesus Christ, to let our light shine before men that they may see our good deeds and praise our Father in heaven. Isn't that what we want? I want Jesus in me, and I want it to kind of leak out on people. It was D.L. Moody, Dwight Moody, who was talking about how we needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit again and again and again. And some preacher had a problem with that whole idea of, once you're filled with the Holy Spirit, aren't you always filled with the Holy Spirit? Why do you keep saying you need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit? And D.L. Moody said, I leak. I thought that was a great, he's a, he's a crackpot, he's a cracked vessel. Holy Spirit leaks out of me. I need to be refilled every once in a while. I love that concept. I allow the Holy Spirit in me, and I, I leak on people. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to, but Jesus gets out. And then I come, and I get filled up at church again to have this opportunity to share him with others. I love my church because the believers here, though we are far from perfect. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Don't look at me when you say that. The world. Holy cow. Recognize the fact that we can and we should be, Right? That we should be offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. That's what Peter said. Not through any power or perfection found in ourselves, but through Christ, our cornerstone. The people of God here at Bentley Creek Wesleyan, they're a unique bunch. I mean a unique bunch. And I'm going to share a bit more about you in the coming weeks and why I love this church so much. I know I'm going to talk about you people next week. Ooh, man, I am going to gossip the tar out of you people. I know I am, but uh, I love my church. But for not, let me just say that. I love being your pastor. I, I love serving alongside you here in this community. And the reasons I do, I believe them to be rock solid. It's because this church believes in the cornerstone of Jesus. If it didn't, I wouldn't be here. I, I wouldn't want to do that. Christ comes first before any pastor or, or person or program that we've got going on. Christ is exalted and worshiped here, <laughs> as it should be, you know? And this church believes in the building blocks of Scripture. I preach from the Bible. That's what I preach from here. And we teach from the Bible around here. We read it and we immerse ourselves in it daily. There's no other text or source of information or inspiration that overshadows the use of Scripture in all that we do and say around here. You never hear of the Book of Mormon or the Book of Rob. You never hear, uh, I had a pastor friend one time that always talked about truisms. I got a truism for you. And it was basically his opinion that he kept sharing his truisms. I, I don't share truisms with you. I just share God's word. It's not mine. I didn't write it. I, I just kind of asked the Lord to help me get it out to you guys. That's what we do. And this church, boy, it's filled with the living stones of God's people. We're not perfect, but we are redeemed. Amen? Man, we're, we're forgiven. We are, check this out from Ephesians, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. We are, a little later on in Ephesians, we are fellow citizens and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. That's what Paul said to the Ephesians. And it is a privilege. It truly is, church, to do life with you guys. Amy and I wouldn't have it any other way. We love being here. We love our church. And may we, regardless of what happens in 2020 or 22, 23, 24, regardless, may we continue to uphold Christ, Scripture, as well as support one another in the days, weeks, and months ahead. God bless you all. Let me pray for you. Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity uh, to share this with our people. And Father, to remind ourselves that we never want to be a church that doesn't do this, that doesn't hold you in highest regard that Jesus is our cornerstone and that the scriptures are our building blocks and that we are, in fact, living stones, which means sometimes being live, we move around when we probably shouldn't and we need to come on back to church or get back into Sunday school or life group. We need to, we need to get back involved in ministry. We're living stones. We can wander away. I, I don't understand the concept of a living stone, but you called us that. And I see where sometimes we can be. But God, I'm so grateful uh, that you've given us the opportunity to do life here. And there's a lot of churches, Lord. I know a lot of churches around the world that are, that are just like Bentley Creek. But Bentley Creek's mine. <laughs> Bentley Creek's where I get to go, where I get to do life with these people. And so, Father, I pray you would encourage us with what we've talked about today, that we would all, 
have a deep respect for the church that we have and the things that we focus on here and that we would continue to do so. And Father, for those that are online with us today uh, who can't be with us because they're from miles and miles away, we pray God's richest blessing upon them where they may be and that perhaps they could find a local congregation to be a part of. And for those that are close by, oh, Father, I don't want to browbeat them or pick on them. I simply just want to say, come on back. Take me back to the place I knew before, the place I, I can depend on uh, getting back into church where we belong. Father, I just pray that you would, uh, you would encourage them, strengthen them, d- dispel the fears that they might have so that they can come be a part of this fellowship again. We miss them, and I know they miss what we have here. This is a great place. I love my church. Father, thank you for it. And I pray that your spirit would continue to dwell in here, move through your people, through this place, through your word, Father, that we might continue to proclaim Jesus Christ as the cornerstone of civilization. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. I told you I would end with Psalm 62 before Roger came up and shared a couple of announcements with you. Here's Psalm 62, a few verses later in 5 and 8, and I took the all but the last verse, and I just pluraled it for all of you. Find rest in God alone. Our hope comes from Him. He alone is our rock and our salvation. He is our fortress. We will not be shaken. Our salvation and our honor depend on God. He is our mighty rock, our refuge. Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to Him, for God is our refuge. God bless you. Roger. Good morning again. Uh, I'm going to just be very brief this morning. We have a special guest, but I do want to bring your attention to the pink insert in there with our Lenten season coming up. Uh, I would urge that we keep not only Pastor Rob, but all of our ministry staff 